что да. Today, Danny will accompany a typically large family on their first trip to Tel Aviv. But before leaving, they offer all the traditional hospitality possible in the cramped hotel room, which will be their home for the coming year. The husband was, uh, was a farmer, like most uh, Jewish families did in Ethiopia. It was quite a well-to-do uh, family there because he had a couple of oxen, and he had horses, and he had sheep. He would work the fields, and he, his children would uh, go out to the fields uh, taking care of, uh, of the cattle and all that. The mother would work mainly at, ho at home and keep uh, the home uh, in good shape. They're flaggerbasted by what's happening. They don't know what exactly it is. They're absorbing everything into them, very much impressed by what, what they see. Not always understanding what it is takes a lot of uh, explanation and takes a while to, to absorb this, uh, these scenes. This um, balloon. 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 Huh? Wendy's, a nice American fast food restaurant. But for them, you don't eat in a restaurant with, uh, with other people, with other outsiders. Usually it's a family thing or a village thing. You don't have people looking on you. It's not easy for them. Now, the food itself is also something different. Meat being ground and presented to you in such a manner is something they, they, they're not used to and they're very suspicious of. And even though they were very suspect, they wanted to find out, wanted to make sure this is a kosher restaurant, they still were not sure it, uh, they touched the meat, so that's why they didn't touch the meat. They only touched the bread and the potato chips. Ordering food or crossing the street are simple skills acquired in a matter of minutes. But learning to thrive in this intimidating new world is a far greater challenge. Danny Budowski's help is vital, but it is only a fraction of the nationwide effort being made on behalf of Israel's newest citizens. There's a kind of period that every new immigrant is allowed to feel protected and taken care of. A person could live, he wouldn't have to worry about work, he'd have money in his pocket, learn the language, look around for a job, and find the place he wanted to live with his family. Israelis call this process absorption, and it begins with an intense period of schooling in the fundamentals of day-to-day -day life. Like their parents, young immigrants spend their days learning the language of their new homeland and playing games which help them adapt to Israel. For children, the novelty of life here is fresh and exciting. They rapidly grasp information and ideas, leaving the impression that the process of absorption can be smooth and simple. But for their parents, who came here steeped in an ancient cultural tradition, embracing a new life, is far from easy. Ethiopians are different because they come from a world totally unlike where other immigrants have been coming from for the past uh, at least 20 years, meaning an undeveloped world. And the assumption is that the Ethiopians needed everything but more. country of immigrants, every citizen can serve as an absorption worker, helping this next generation acquire the basic tools of a modern society, to begin feeling that they belong. As the newly arrived Ethiopians struggle to adapt, we can get a clue to their future by looking at the progress made by 
those who arrived in the early 1980s. Many are still heavily reliant on a support system which was intended to help them for just the first 12 months. For thousands of Jews who trekked to the Sudan, it's been more than eight years since cultures and centuries collided. They have problems of getting the job living in an urban, urban area as opposed to a village which was small and very condensed, very cohesive, um, but where they were familiar with everything, with everybody here. They are put in a city, even if it's a small town, it's still not the same as a village. Um, the language problems and barrier, the mentality, the food, the taste, the dress, the clothes that we wear, they are still in the process of making it in Israel. They do need help. Michael Benabou works with Ethiopians who have lived in Israel for several years. <laughs> in this bomb shelter in Jerusalem, he runs a new social club for these young immigrants, most of whom now speak mainly Hebrew, having almost forgotten their parents' native language. They said, we are dealing with few problems. We all attend boarding schools all over the country. We have something in common that we are of Ethiopian origin and that our parents are living in Jerusalem. But when we come for the weekend, we don't know each other. We go out in the streets of Jerusalem. We see Ethiopians, youth, but we don't know them. We just know that we are Ethiopian. We have a lot in common, but yet we have nothing in common. It's difficult to imagine these teenagers cloaked in rags, starving in a Sudanese refugee camp. But that was their history, and Michael Benabou believes that retelling their stories will help them understand themselves and each other. A lot of them came when in the age of six, seven, four, five. They do not really remember exactly. Remember they walked. They remember they were taken from one place to another. And by sharing it with the whole group, by seeing that each one has his own unique story, but similar. It creates some kind of a uh, group um, feeling, group cohesiveness. The confusion and alienation of these teenagers is both a normal function of adolescence and a natural result of the immigrant experience. The universal need of adolescents to model themselves on an adult generation with strong roots and a sense of self-esteem is frustrated. Adult Ethiopians are themselves struggling with a sense of rootlessness. Older people who came at the, around the age of 40 or 50, they were simple farmers in Ethiopia. Uh, they had a hard time to study, uh, to learn the language. They can't find a real uh, job that will fit them. And most of the time, um, many of them just sit at home and get social security money and um, don't do anything uh, special. The Ethiopians' tightly knit patriarchal society has largely disintegrated since their arrival in Israel. Adult men find themselves humiliated, taught and trained by their far more adaptable children. As a result, they lose face, respect and authority. Because the younger generation lost the respect for the older generation, the older people really don't seem that they have any aim or in their life in Israel and um, feel very much frustrated and are quite lost. Ironically, while men have been set adrift by this process of absorption, Many women have been able to seize opportunities never before available to them in their traditional village society. Women who have money run counter to the Ethiopian culture because in Ethiopia the men handle all the economic matters in the family and not the women. They find uh, that uh, working gives them uh, a lot of strength and they have uh, money that they can use for their own uh, purposes 
and they want freedom. In the Jewish tradition, what is important is every person should be able to make his living and be able to take care of himself and his family. The Ethiopian Jews come with that value. They come from a world where there's a, there's a certain term, it's called gobez, and there's no word in English or Hebrew that touches on it because it combines being strong and brave with being smart. And that's a wonderful combination for getting ahead in Israel, just like it was for taking care of yourself in Ethiopia. But if the people absorbing him don't know that value, they can project on him their fantasies. What are their fantasies? That he comes from a backward country, a primitive culture, that he needs to be encouraged, he needs to be helped. So instead of independence, you can turn it into a kind of dependency. And dependency has a certain uh, seductiveness to it. And not just for the Ethiopians themselves. Every gift needs a giver. And there's an age-old Jewish tradition of helping those less fortunate. And every day I tell a group, you're here at the most important moment in history. You know that we cannot fail. You know that we must succeed. That we must do everything possible to make these immigrations work. The Western Jewish person sees somebody black and he assumes, ah, it's not only a Jew, but a black Jew. What a double sort of whammy, if you will. Here is the really ideal, typical, helpless Jews who were persecuted in Ethiopia and have everything going against them. They're black and they come from a poor country and everything is such that they need everything we can give them, our money and our support. So for at least 50 years, there's been a Save the Falasha movement, a Save the Ethiopian Jews movement. It's a big movement. And people are enthusiastic and feel noble when they contribute to that. Now, what happens sometimes is that the Ethiopian Jews play to that kind of audience. And that comes back to the idea that they can make themselves just a little bit more helpless than they really are. Now, sometimes it's done with consciousness so that they can take care of themselves perfectly well, but if somebody wants them to be somehow needy, they can say, yes, we're needy. Or if somebody wants them to have been persecuted terribly in Ethiopia, they can say, yes, we have hundreds of years of persecution at the hands of the Ethiopian kings, even though when it's not exactly historically true. It now appears that for decades, contact between the Jews of the West and the Ethiopians has been built on a foundation of misconception. Myths about their history continue to be passed on as fact. For many years, people have viewed the Jews of Ethiopia, and this is still clearly their popular image, as a lost tribe that reached Ethiopia, some people say 2,000 years ago, today you most commonly hear 2,500 years ago, and after Ethiopia became a Christian country, a remnant of Jews survived and held on to their faith. Today, more and more scholars are saying that the Jews of Ethiopia are a group that developed in Ethiopia five or six hundred years ago. So they're not a lost Jewish tribe. They're an indigenous Ethiopian phenomenon, an Ethiopian ethnic group. During their history in Ethiopia, the Jews of Ethiopia have made various decisions that were connected to their survival. In the 20th century, a large group of them make a decision to go the path of entering mainstream world Jewry. And that has a price. In order to become like the rest of world Jewry, they need to develop a relationship with world Jewry, which is essentially a relationship of dependence. As much as world Jewry is interested in giving things to the Ethiopian Jews, the Ethiopian Jews develop a clear sense of this is an alternative route to success and to survival, accepting from world Jewry, whether it's money, whether it's teachers, whether it's help in getting out. And this dependence only increases over the years. So if you had to take one major characteristic of the, of the relationship between world Jewry and Ethiopian Jews, it's the growing dependence, which begins with very subtle processes and culminates in a virtual total dependence. Almost complete immersion in Western values inevitably leaves the Ethiopian community in Israel feeling besieged. And many older Ethiopians express concern that integration and assimilation might eradicate their traditional culture.